hey guys, welcome to the Strength Collective, where we talk about all things health and fitness with a sprinkle of strength. My name's Tammy. Alex. Ben. And Chris. And we've got some am- <laughs> and we've got some amazing visitors today that are just going to introduce themselves. Yeah, so uh so I'm Curtis. Um played all sorts of sports uh, over my time, football, swimming, basketball, American football, and most recently weightlifting. Uh, so that's with the Rona Strength team coached by uh, the amazing Chris Speed. Hi, my name is Donna, and uh, Donna Noble, and I'm a yoga teacher, um, an intuitive wellness coach, um, also um, very big into making well-being for everybody. So I'm a body positive yoga teacher as well and also into anti-racism of all about diversity and inclusion in the wellness space. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Riz or Rizwan. Uh, got a background in terms of sports. I, I used to play a lot of uh, football, rugby uh, and cricket in, in sort of my school years and uh, subsequently thereafter. Uh, more recently got into powerlifting over the last three, four years and uh, just to sort of uh, do that as a general hobby. And da, 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 da. last but not least. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Abby Adamson. I have no affiliation with sport or yoga or anything like that whatsoever. But um, I am a anti-racist um, educator. I own two diversity and inclusion companies, um, working with really big brands like Spotify and Lululemon and you know, um, Adidas. Um, yeah, just really trying to level the playing field when it comes to anti-racism and diversity and inclusion and making sure everybody's accepted in the world. So, yeah. That's absolutely amazing. So today, obviously, we're going to be talking about race and colorism in the workplace and fitness industry. But as because I know this is what you kind of specialize in, because this is where I, I met you through frame because of this. Can you give us a definition of what you would define racism and colorism is so then we can all be on the same playing field? Oh, gosh. I mean, talk to about throw that out to everybody else, just in case every, anybody's definition is slightly different. Well, oh, gosh. What is, um, wow, what is colorism? <sighs> Isn't it funny how her reception went perfectly out there? That, tell me that was not perfect timing. Do you think she did that on purpose? Let's see. Let's give her a few more seconds. She did not want to answer that question. Exactly. <laughs> divine intervention there. I think that was divine. L- literally. Are you back? Ooh, ooh, your reception's going. Abs, are you there? Okay, let me throw it out to somebody else. Does anybody want to give us a definition of racism and colorism before we start so it doesn't feel like it's just me talking? Oh, is race is on you from your perspective? Uh, well, look, looking into this from a uh, legal perspective, law being my, my profession, uh, as I'm having a look uh, in terms of what we have uh, in, in terms of legislation as a legal definition of racism, and um, just looking at uh, race as being one of the protected characteristics which are protected under the Equality Act. Uh, and it goes, that act goes on to define race as um, uh, including one's color, nationality, or, or ethnic or national origins. And it goes on to talk about racism in terms of being uh, an aspect of, or, or a type of discrimination. Uh, and the act goes on to prohibit uh, such discrimination uh, in in the UK by organisations, businesses, or on the individual level. Uh, Interestingly, it it identifies two uh, types of discrimination. So there's direct discrimination, uh, where it gives the example where a person discriminates against another person if because of a protected characteristic, like, for example, race, A treats B uh, less favourably than A would treat others. Uh, so that's direct discrimination, where you have, you know, a direct rule or policy which uh, which directly discriminates against a, a group which has a protected characteristic, and of course we're interested in race here. Uh, 
the, the other type of discrimination is in what's known as indirect discrimination. Uh, and that is where a person discriminates against another person if A has a, a policy or rule or, or criteria uh, which is discriminatory in relation to um, a, a relevant protected uh, characteristic. So, for example, here, race. Um, and so the way, the way that works is, uh, we're talking about indirect discrimination here, the way it works is there's a general a rule, uh, policy or criteria which applies on the whole to everyone, but because of uh, a particular protected character characteristic that an individual has, they might be indirectly discriminated against because of the application or the general application of that rule, policy or, or criteria. Uh, and there's a uh, a relevant example, which, uh, which uh, you know, perhaps we can come back to uh, at some point, which was the um, uh, the discussion last year that was going on in powerlifting in terms of uh, Muslim female women lifters uh, being able to uh, compete in the sport whilst wearing at uh, clothing, uh, which which was um, um, in accordance with their religious beliefs, and, and that was a, a good example of a rule. A practice or a policy or a criteria which applied on the whole to everyone but indirectly discriminated against this particular group so perhaps we can come back to that at some yeah. point in the discussion. No, that's perfect. Yeah. I'm so sorry everyone, that was terrible timing. <laughs> no, that's okay. And um, Does anybody else want to give us a definition? Hand up and then I'll just... Abs and racism. Yeah, so um so in a nutshell, colorism are prejudice oh, prejudice attitudes or discriminatory acts against people based on the color or the shade or tone of their skin. So if we're talking about colorism in context, is perfect example I like to use when I'm doing um my workshops with uh, clients is if you think about music videos, for instance, hip hop music videos, they're always full of light skinned girls. You know, um, if you look at Hollywood, you see Zendaya, you will see um, Yara Shahidi, Halle Berry, you know, they've always booked them busy because they're a fairest, they're a fairest skin tone so they can assimilate closer to the white race. Um, and then when, even if you look at someone very close to the whole, you know, anti-racism movement, look at Angela Davis. Angela Davis was the poster child um, for everything anti-racist, um, you know, from the 60s onwards, um, especially during segregation and Jim Crow laws in the States. But Angela Davis was not the first of her kind. There were actually loads and loads of dark-skinned women who were, you know, pushing this forward. Same thing with Rosa Parks. She was not the first person. You need to do your history. She was not the first person to say no about moving to the back of the bus. But because they were fairer skinned and because they were closer to the white race and, you know, everything that's good, they end up being the poster children for race. And that's what colorism is. It's, it's, it's you know, being more accepted because you are uh, reflecting the, the dominant race. When we're talking about racism, um, then in a nutshell, again, it's just prejudice, attitudes or discriminatory acts against people based on their actual or perceived racial status, which is very different to ethnicity as well. So uh, in a nutshell, race is a biological construct where uh, ethnicity can be something that's um, acquired. So your, your, your language, um, the, the food that you eat, your attire. Um, sorry, I, did, I went all into like, um, professor mode at uni there but just thought i'd break that down and just so you know there are four types of discrimination um just that's from my hr background just thought i'd let everybody know so if you want to talk about four types of discrimination not going to go over them again but direct discrimination absolutely indirect discrimination harassment and victimization are the four types of discrimination that you can have underneath the equality act of 2010. Oh, that's perfect so guys can we bring it to the fitness industry and talk about why the fitness industry and the corporate world still looks the way it does and do we think it's changing who would literally just pop your hand up and i'll hotspot you so or hotspot like this is a phone i will spotlight you who wants to go first i'll pick curtis you're looking rather handsome with that lovely background so i'm going to throw it out to you all right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll speak probably a bit more on kind of the workplace, more more so than the fitness industry, um, just because that's not kind of my profession. But um, so 
guys probably won't know, but I work for the police. Um, not, I'm not Ooh. an officer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let me put myself on mute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm not a, not an officer, but I work alongside officers kind of in a staff role and such. Um, and I think one thing that's quite obvious to me there is that there is a lot of um, ideas about what the police is like for, from an outsider, but from kind of being inside, I personally haven't had any negative experiences, but just from my point of view, I don't see kind of representation throughout the police. Um, so while it's not, you know, an immediate negative experience, it is a bit of a kind of a flag that I think obviously is going to, you know, does need to be addressed. And I do think it is changing. Um, I know throughout our recruitment, um, you know, we pushing the diversity um, kind of aspect to it. So, you know, whether that's race, uh, gender, disabilities, all of that is pushed as part of our recruitment. And I know that managers are pressed on, you know, are you interviewing people from these different backgrounds? Um, and I think especially, you know, we think about what's happened in the past year. I think police is definitely one of those kind of places where you need to get that right. Um, you know, we can see what happens when you look on TV, you look around you, uh, and you, know, you see the government or you see something happening in the police and you're like, that does not reflect what, what I am, what my society is like, what my community is like. Um, and, and for me, I think it, it really is, you know, if, if people don't look at the police and see themselves reflected in it, everything just falls apart, you know, before you even start having interactions, um, you know, you, you lose that kind of being policed by consent and you're happy to be policed to what we're seeing a lot of now is where it's us versus them. You know, the, the police are kind of just seen as a little arm of the government um, by extension, you know, the, the puppets of the Tories. Um, and I think you can eliminate that to some extent by just bringing in people with different viewpoints because those, you know, everyone knows the stereotypical viewpoints, um, you know, going back decades over the police, you know, um, things like the Stephen Lawrence inquiry and Damalola Taylor and things like that where racism surrounded the kind of investigations, um, those v views of the police will stay until people really can look at the police, see you know, a couple walking down the street or a superintendent on TV, a chief constable on TV, and think those people are for me. And I think it's really difficult to do that without having people that look like us um, out there and visible. Okay, thank you. That's actually great. Red? Um, just interesting to, to, you know, mentioning working with the police and uh, particularly the, uh, uh, the incident regarding Stephen Lawrence. Um, and this dovetails nicely with um, the discussion that you were trying to elicit right now about the fitness industry and, you know, racism within it. Uh, going back two decades, I think it's in 1999, the McPherson inquiry uh, into uh, the Stephen Lawrence killing uh, identified um, the police as an establishment which was institutionally racist and the report and the inquiry uh, went on to actually define at that time you know two decades ago almost or actually in fact more than two de decades now it went on to de define uh, what it perceived as being uh, institutional racism uh, and I, I think that the words the, the definition given was you know the collective failure of, of an organization uh, to provide uh, an appropriate service uh, uh, um, to people because of their colour, their culture, their background or origin. And, and I, I think that's a, a useful definition, one that we ought to cover in this discussion about racism within the fitness industry. Anybody else want to jump in? <laughs> okay, perfect. What I'm slightly concerned about, right, is in the fitness industry, and you guys can correct me if you think I'm wrong, um, I do not want to be a token, right? So um, the whole of last year with the whole Black Lives, Lat Black Lives Matter movement going on, I felt like with certain brands, I became a token. Um, I became a token because there was only me. And then when I voiced that there was only me, it was like, you should be grateful that we've at least picked you. And yes, I'm grateful, but I've worked hard. I've got 10 years experience, I have my degree, I have all this background in different sports that I've competed. I've kind of earned my spot at the table. Don't make me feel like you're doing me a favor. 
has anybody does anybody kind of want to talk about that in terms of tokenism whether in your corporate world or in the fitness industry guys i'll start picking you guys because you guys are acting real quiet and we don't do quiet here okay you know what dance i'm coming straight for you boom don't forget you're on mute um yeah i i, I totally agree with you on 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 that and even before all that happened last year but because basically you find that in the fitness industry especially in yoga you find look on the schedule you see one person and, and it's um it's a case of tokenism and you know and what i'd rather happen is that i'm judged on my ability not on the color of my skin in 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 terms of that and even more so last summer my inbox or my you know my dms got started to be in and out you know i me being black became very trendy so suddenly it's like oh can we highlight you can we share your voice and stuff like that and, and it got to it got so bad as well at one point that um i was i co-founded um created noir fit fest which is the first uk black fitness festival and we had a sponsor and then it became very apparent that we it was tokenism because when we we agreed the terms for them to advertise us and support us and we didn't get that at all and we pulled them up on it it was like oh we didn't know we didn't agree all that and they had so we had to, you know, so in the end, it was like they just wanted to be able to say that they were supporting the black brand um, to make themselves look good. But they didn't even share the platform, the fact we were doing it with their ambassadors. They didn't even, you know, it, it was just tokenism. It was a marketing team and they apologized, and, but it wasn't really good. So I had to call them out. I didn't do it publicly, but I called them out so they won't do it again. And that's very much what we've seen. And it, we've still seen it now that, you know, the black squares came out, everyone was in support of, of, of George Floyd. And how many months later, you know, or even a few days later, BAU is back to normal. You know, it's like it was forgotten. And even now it's, it's, it's a challenge to see where all these people that were out there gonna support us and change their way of working. It's, you know, it was all very much performative. I think there's a handful of people or brands that I can say that they're still doing what they undertook to make their, their platforms more inclusive and more diverse. I think I think the onus is on all of us. And I, again, I'm not. I can only speak from. Well, I can't speak from the fitness industry, but I have worked with a few fitness brands. The onus is on all of us to start holding people accountable. You put in your a black square on social media means absolutely nothing, you know. And I always have exploratory calls with every client I'm about to work with, and I will say to them, "Okay, well, what have you done over the last? It's, let's be let's be real." The domino effect of the aftermath of George Floyd was something that we had never seen before. And a lot of people had asked me, Abby, look, you know, George Floyd, unfortunately, was not the first victim of police brutality. What do you think was different this time? My answer to that is that this is the first time we've had it recorded for all of us to see and the first time we've gone through a global health pandemic. So no one can say that we're stuck at home. You know, we, we have to absorb the information we're taking in. You can't feign ignorance anymore. I think for me, it's incredibly important that we stop walking on eggshells, you know, and, and start holding people accountable. It's time to upset the apple cart. None of this walking on it. I say, kick the cart down the road, you know, and what will be, will be, I think it's time to start disrupting everything. I will be very honest from what some of the clients that I've worked with in fitness, they're very elitist. Um, you know, they're very wealthy, you know, um, I have to say they're very white and they they move recklessly you know i'm going back to yoga actually um we um were working with a client so i'm trying to be very careful so i don't drop no names we were working with a client who um within yoga were just you know there was no there were no in there were no asians working there were no people of color and yoga's not a, 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 a yoga didn't come from you know Blonde hair woman with with, with blue eyes. It's just, no, I want to be no, 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 Caucasian. but I want to try and make it. You know, try to make it. Please. I'm trying to make this inclusive and language possible. as possible. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you hold know, on one second. Me. Hold on, one. guys. Um, on a serious note, let's be as honest as we can because I'm really sick and tired of hearing podcasts that say they're about that life and they're not about that life. Like if you feel a certain way, and this is also because Ben, you're white, Alex, you're white. Feel free to speak from your perspective because your perspective does matter. Even though it's always your perspective that we hear every day as <laughs> men, 
your perspective does matter and it means something for me because you guys you know i wouldn't have picked you guys to be on this strength collective if i did not value your input and your thoughts so feel free because i know ben ben's mr pc ben's like i don't want to say anything so please let's just be honest and if we want to say white say why if it, it feels natural say white you know i just i just think you know it's it's black people and people of color cannot do this on our own and i think it's really important that that you know you know saying you know we've got ben we've got we've got um you know Alex on this call is that we need people behind us i'm t white people are in the majority you do have the power this allyship journey isn't one that we can all that people of color can win on our own you know we need people who have those privileges and i i when I say white privilege, I don't mean that, you know, obviously white privilege doesn't mean that a white person has cannot go through hardship. It means any hardships you've gone through has not been because, because of the color of your skin. And I think within the fitness industry, from some of the behaviors that I have witnessed being exhibited by people in power, sometimes I do look to the white allies who are like, yeah, no, we stand beside you. I'm like, yeah, but I heard crickets coming from you, crickets. So we can't do this on our own. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really interesting point, actually. Um, and for, so, I mean, the guys, the guys that listen to the podcast will know. So, and um, X Army is my predominant background switch to the corporate environment in the last sort of four years. Now, I think, Abby, you make a really good point. Um, you know, and everything you have said actually chimes with a lot of my past experience in the military and then turn corporate. Um, and I'm sure, Abby, you've probably got stats on this. But actually, looking back now, the army was pretty diverse, actually. And actually, I, I, I count myself quite lucky for the experiences that I had for the 12 years that I spent in the military, about what I was taught, one, about other cultures. I spent a lot of time in Tanzania, Burundi, and Somalia, and a lot of time in the Middle East. And actually, we were afforded quite a lot of education to be equipped, you know, forgetting the military imperative, right, but just dealing with the population on, 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 on a sort of bare bones basis. Fast forward a number of years, and this is where I'm sort of draw the, draw the line between the workplace and sport. I'm actually quite shocked um, over how far behind big corporates are behind actually where the military was. Now, actually, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I probably would have said the military was probably in a, in, in a, in a pretty poor state. But actually looking back at it now with 14, 15 years experience, I think corporates are catching up with where they were. Now, you know, your point, Abby, about, you know, people like myself needing to, to get in there and support is, is, is exactly where it's needed to be. But I think the biggest problem that corporates face, and I think this extrapolates across sort of to what Donna was saying in terms of the fitness industry, is actually building it from grassroots level. The one big thing, and Temi, we've spoken about this, I think, you know, I tipped our hat to it, whether it be on the podcast before, or um, you know, just conversations is around actually how do you how do you how does it not become token? How do you build it out up from the ground up? And that needs everybody's cooperation. And as you say, and Abby, again, you've tipped your hat to it that you know you've got the guys at the top have been in whatever industry that is, whether it be corporate or fitness, for 25 years. You and you're probably not going to change their attitudes. But you need to make them understand and have those coming up from the bottom up that change it in the long run and it's not a, and it's not a flash to bang process it's going to take a long time but it needs the effort of absolutely everybody and i love the fact that i think it was i think it was abby or donna that you said you know actually sometimes everybody needs to be down and dirty and harsh and when you disagree something with something that is fundamentally wrong in today's society being able to jump out and go no stop think about what you've just said even if you haven't meant it to be malicious you're automatically excluding a group and everybody across the board is wanting to be educated and then follow through with those actions. And you, you see that, you know, I see that across whether it be say corporate environment or sport. And I think it's a really, you know, some really interesting points that, that, you know, that you both brought out there. So guys, you know, when people say to you, they don't see color. So I've had somebody say to me, Tammy, I don't see color. Like when I'm hiring somebody, I don't hire because of their name. I don't hire because of their, the color of their skin. But I've had somebody say to me, oh, Tammy, well, they didn't say my name. They said, oh, you're the black girl. I was going to actually give you the job, but I thought you were the other black girl. How mad is that? This was about 10 years ago. 
and I don't want to name the company because I did. I the, the owner was a sweet old man, but you know when they're so politically incorrect. But because of their age, you almost want to give them a blight, but we know we shouldn't. But I felt so scared to say something because I didn't want to lose my job. But my the other employees that were around me, I felt like say something, stick up for me, but nobody did. Does anybody else kind of, has that happened to anybody else in the industry where people say, I don't see color? Um, can I address that? That happens very, a lot in yoga. It's almost like, you know, I don't see color, we are, we are all one. And, um, and, and it's only recently that a lot of people said they saw color, but they were afraid to, to actually um, talk to that because they thought that they would be vilified in, in terms of doing that. But it's only because now I've said to people, if you don't see color and you don't see my color, you, that means you, you're not acknowledging my lived experience. And I think people now begin to see that. So they're not using that anymore or they try not to. People are starting to learn that. But it's, it's almost like, you know, we are one. And I don't see colour, those two go very much together in the in the yoga and wellness industry. And that 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 saying doesn't even make any any damn sense because you know the only people who should ever say that sentence are people who are visually impaired. The, that's that's the only time I should ever hear someone tell me that it does not make any sense. The idea of not seeing colour is nice in theory, but in actuality it is incorrect. And anyone who's able to who's able to see can discern and recognize one skin skin color from the next. To say you don't see color is incredibly offensive because how can you possibly fix something that you don't believe you can't actually see? It's just like saying you don't see gender. So yeah, I completely agree. So guys, in the fitness industry right now, what do you think are the what's holding us back? What's holding, especially for me as a black woman, I can only speak as a black female, what's holding us back? Because I see a lot of campaigns pushing um, certain individuals as black females, right? But I'm like, hold on, they're mixed race. So for mm. me, you know, how are you guys seeing that? And is that something that it's just in my head? Because one of the things that I find as a black woman is I, I doubt myself a lot. I'm like, is it, is it me or is this an issue? Or like, do I have to, like, I'll give you an example. I will walk into a certain building that I work in. My personality, my tone of voice will automatically change. I will become a lot, like, I do not want to own as much space. And you guys know me, I'm just silly. I just like a laugh, but I feel like I can't be my authentic self because automatically I'm deemed as, you know. Aggressive. <laughs> well, one of the corporate um, companies I work for told me not to wear my braids, that it was intimidating. Imagine. So, and this was only what, two years ago? So only two years ago, I worked for a massive chain in the fitness industry that told me not to wear my braids because my braids were intimidating. So we still have to go through this. Am I like the only one that feels that or is it, it's not in my head? Uh, uh, no, I think I definitely see it more than experience it now. Um, and I definitely notice it more amongst, I think when it comes to female fitness, not so much, I think it's getting, I hope it's getting somewhat more even in like the strength sports or like weightlifting and powerlifting, but across to like general fitness. Um, well, go on the Nike website and start scrolling through, especially the women's clothing and scroll through and then have like the whole thing about, you know, colorism in your head and see how many different people from different backgrounds or different e ethnicities you have. And you don't, you're not going very far, like past my color shade because I'm quite light. You're not going for far past this. Like, and that, that's the first thing you'll notice. So you'll think, oh, it's quite they diverse. They have that one person, one. that one yeah. dark person that yeah, we tick that box. Well, yeah, like the, you can see even on somewhere like, um, oh, is this, like Zolando Asos, there is one darker guy they use, but they almost use him across everything. So it's not like there's even a lot of different representations. It's like one person or a few people. You can see it even in, even in our sports, Hemi and like Alex and Ben, like with weightlifting and powerlifting, you can see it if it is someone they've chosen who is of darker skin or who is black or is Asian or is from um, an ethnic minority background, they always choose the same people because it's almost like you've been approved. And I've definitely felt I've experienced that through school, through rugby, like a university. I almost was, I don't know if it's fortunate or not, but I seem to have the, the misfortune to be judged as the approved one who wasn't as, wasn't like, I've had someone say, oh, you're not as bad as, bad as the others or you're different. 
and I just thought what 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 in the world does that mean and then I sort of started to go more into an into the adult world and realized ah I, I get what they mean and that's I think that still happens it's just that no one's going to come out and say that to anyone anymore because they know they can't get away with it but from a business point of view I think larger places who have to sell things are going to look at who can we put on the cover who can we put uh, put in our clothes who can we use to sell things that's actually going to sell things and they're not they're going to ha- have that kind of like the balance in their hand of being like, ah so do we have a more dive are we do we be more diverse at the risk of losing out on a bit of money or do we just go and keep earning money and take the flap and i think unfortunately too many places still go all the way to the side of we're not going to worry about being diverse we'll make it we'll make a showing towards it by putting someone who's very light-skinned or a bit more racially ambiguous Chris, in the mix. with what you just said you hit the nail on the head there that you know they'll pick cells over being ethically yeah. correct right yeah. but if you look at fashion if you look at music if you look at style it's heavily pushed by the ethnic minority community aka the black community so if our stuff sells why doesn't it sell when we wear it why is it what we have is acceptable on an other or on a kim kardashian or on Mm. a amber rose or on a racially ambiguous person but the, the, the ghost that's saying they want our blackness but not our blues. Oh, sorry, sorry, I did, I did, I didn't hear that. Say it again. They want our blackness but not our blues. So they want the rhythm. They want the rhythm but not the blues. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Yeah, they want the rhythm. I just had blues. to get you to repeat it because that mm. is that is very true. Um, Alex, can I ask you just a random question? Do you feel? Have you ever felt a difference? obviously by yourself in the UK with Kitty or in America with Kitty. By the way, um, Alex's partner is Asian. So do you, have you ever noticed that you're treated differently or has she ever said to you that she's been treated differently? Just a, and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Um, I'm being really quiet because I'm basically here to learn right now. Um, that's why I haven't piped up yet. With with a uh, kitty, yeah, tons. So she she often have it from the perspective of one being a, a woman who lifts, and people are having that kind of um, disregard for a uh, woman's ability in that sense. Um, but when we are out and about on a rare occasion, we're not in the gym. People do treat her differently particularly when we were in Poland that was a big deal like that was a a a sideshow kind of deal there um so yeah very much so very much so but um in a previous relationship I was in there was a situations where uh, we get pulled over by the police and when they saw there's a white man in the car they would let you go until they knew that they didn't and that that was a that was not open enough for me that's something i wasn't really aware of wow that's really yeah, interesting. Right. you know yeah. it, that kind of takes us into the next thing that i really want us to talk about microaggressions i feel like there, there's so much of that in the corporate world and also in the fitness world that you sometimes doubt yourself and you sometimes feel like you're mad like I, I can give you guys an example where I thought I was going mad and if it was just me. I remember I used to work in this running shop in Camden, right? And this lady said, oh, I don't wanna be served. This is in Camden, Camden town, which is very multicultural, right? And she said, oh, I, I would like to be helped by that gentleman. And I was like, well, I'm the assistant manager here. Can I help you? She was like, no, no, no. I'm just gonna wait for that guy. I was like, okay, then. 20 minutes later, I'm like, let me help you. She was like, I don't want to be helped by your kind. So a bit of me thought maybe it was just because I'm a woman, right? Maybe it's because of my color, but I didn't want to just think that this lady was being outright direct. And the manager of the store was there and looked and said, stood up for me and was like, I'm sorry, that's unacceptable. We do not tolerate that. And we don't want your money here. Please leave the store. But so many things like that have happened to me over the years that you sometimes think, am I overthinking it? And I'm starting to realize that it's not that I'm overthinking it. It's just that now 
you know what it is and it's okay to call it out. How do you guys feel about microaggression in the fitness industry and in the corporate world, especially from a, let's say a Muslim male perspective? You know, I'm coming straight to you for that. <laughs> well, you know, in, in, the, in the legal world, uh, I, I've been, I, you lot may have heard uh, reports uh, over the last six months or so uh, where um, black barristers, black lawyers, uh, we're going into court and being mistaken for, the, for, for defendants. I've had that happen so many times to me where I walk into the court and, you know, before I've even got inside the court, the court's usher or the list caller will come up to me, uh, pen and paper in hand, uh, sorry, which defendant are you? Uh, and it'll take a moment just to sort of step back and say, hold on, I'm not a defendant. Uh, I'm a lawyer, here's my, my defendant's here. And then, you know, there'll, there'll be this all of a sudden, you know, an embarrassed sort of look and, you know, they realise the mistake that they've made. Uh, sometimes it's happening in court. Uh, uh, magistrates pointing to, point to me and saying, oh, the doctor over there, you need, uh, defendants need to go stand in the dock. I'm not, I'm not a defendant. <laughs> you know, sometimes, and, and, and you know, these aren't microaggressions, but you know, these, 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 are, these are things that, you know, it, it, as an individual, and as a person, you know, those kind of, kinds of things can have, you know, a, a, a real big impact on a person. Uh, the, the amount of times that can happen before you, you start to think, well, hold on, it's okay for me to to be to appear as a defendant or as a client of someone here, but you know, if I'm on an equal footing, that that, that can't be the case. That's you know that that's that's something that they that they can't they can't fathom uh, that one one would be on an equal footing uh, to others. So you know these kind of microaggressions occur on a daily basis. You know, uh, especially after particularly after any sort of incidents that occur. I remember. Um, uh, over the years, since since 9-11, in fact, uh, there's been occasions where I, I've been on, on trains, on tubes, and uh, I'd say to my colleagues, uh, oh, you know, there's there's a real sort of like, um, you know, people start reacting uh, to, to my sort of coming on the tube. And, and they were like, no, 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 we can't see it, we can't see it. Up until one point, one day, I was with a colleague on the tube, sat down, and the man who I sat next to looked at me, <laughs> got up, and sort of uh, go off the train. You know, it's almost like, you know, uh, there's this assumption uh, or, I don't know, fear perhaps of, of otherness. And I think that's perpetuated uh, by the media and also by government as well. Um, you know, so you guys may be familiar with uh, something that's called the prevent strategy, which is a, uh, a policy or a strategy which has been developed by the government uh, to try and tackle this issue of radicalization. But what that strategy actually does is perpetuate the notion that a Muslim minority in this in the UK is a minority that's not to be trusted. And so as a result of that, what they've done is rolled out uh, training across the public sectors so of schools, uh, teachers, uh, local authority workers, uh, government officials, civil servants have all undergone training uh, where, where they're meant to identify risks of radicalization or people who, who are at risk of radicalization. This is like a half an hour or an hour's worth of training. And of course, you've got images in there of you know people who are Muslim uh, males with beards or you know women with headscarves. And, and 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 that you know that kind of training in half an hour, you're not you're not you're not you're not you're, you're not sort of uh, it's it's not an academic discourse. All that is mm -hmm. is perpetuating the notion that a particular minority is a minority that we cannot trust. And uh, we always need to have under the microscope. So yeah, that's a, that's a, a major part of uh, some of the things that we we, we deal with as uh, people of uh, black and ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and go, going back to uh, the issue of uh, George Floyd and the, uh, the murder that took place last year, it was a watershed moment in the sense that you know all of a sudden I think you know black people across the world, people, people Asian people, people of uh, 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 color. All of us sent, uh, all of us felt a sense of frustration when we saw uh, what happened on that footage, uh, because that was a culmination of years and years of, uh, you know, racism, discrimination, which has been directed to us and our communities. And off the back of that, you know, there were so many discussions uh, that were had. I mean, it, 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 the momentum that it generated, uh, what one, one can only hope that that's maintained and that you know people bring about change as a result of that. But I remember there was, there, was, there was so many discussions going on in social media and one person, a doctor who I follow on Instagram, uh, posted a post which resonated very much with me. And, it, and, and I think it was words to the effect of, um, imagine every conversation that you've ever had a, with a white person was to, to try and, you were, you were 
you were sort of unconsciously trying to prove that you're a good black. And, you know, I, I, I see you, Taini, and nodding your head. And that, that resonated with me because, you know, so many times in, in my life, I've had to open up conversations with people, white people, and it's done on the premise. I'm doing, I mean, you know, it, it's a it's a instinctive thing that I'm doing unconsciously, where I'm trying to sort of like you know overtly be polite or overtly be you know uh, seen yeah. as sort of accepted. Yeah. And, and, and looking back, I sort of kick myself for it. Why 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 why, why do I have, why do I have to do that? Why do I have to go out of my way to show that? Oh, you know, I'm not like the people that you may have seen pictured on the front page of you know the uh, the scum newspapers. You know, why, why do I have to do that? So yeah, no, exactly. um, I'm just throwing some thoughts out there. You know, it's, uh, this is some you know raw emotion really because those kind of things you know they 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 build up and they have a real and tangible effect uh, on on us as as individuals and on a, uh, on us as as communities living here. Abby, yeah, no, I'm just listening to um, what Riz said there and that what you just described there is what we call white fragility it's this notion of walking on eggshells around white people to make sure that they don't feel threatened and they don't feel that you know we are coming we are coming for them i mean someone said to me uh, i was working for a, a big uh, bank doing anti-racism and they were like well do you know the biggest <laughs> I laughed. The biggest threat um, is, is you know, um, you know, white men are on the decline. And I honestly, honestly, I was thinking, I forgot that they were actually paying me money to do that because I started laughing. I started laughing because I'd never heard of anything so ridiculous in my life. Um, and, you know, and I said, it's not our job. It's not black people's jobs, not Asian people's jobs, not Latinx, you know, people, it's not our jobs to make you feel better about yourself. A lot of white people are more concerned about being called, called a racist than the actual racism that's going on in, in itself. You know, that's not, we, we don't need to pander, pander to that fragility. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. It, it's, we've come to the end of that now. Going back to what, um, to what Temi said about microaggressions, um, there, are, there are different types of microaggressions. You know, there are micro insults. So these, these are the, um, you know, verbal, nonverbal communications that subtly convey rudeness or insensitivity. So someone like, you know, touching a black woman's hair, for example. Then you have micro invalidations, yeah? So these, this is there to exclude and negate or nullify an individual's thoughts or feelings. So, you know, mistaking people of the same race, for example. And then you have micro assaults. So I'm giving examples because there are, there's a lot and I know maybe some of you might know all of this and you, this might be the first time you're hearing this. But there are micro assaults. So micro assaults are, when you're discriminating in overt forms so for example you cross the street when you see people of color walking towards you or you get on public transport and you see there's one seat left in between an asian man and a black woman and you decide to stand and break your back because you don't want to sit in between them so there are different types of microaggressions and the one i, I the um lived experience I, I want to share was um i was a global talent acquisition um um, lead for a very well-known um, film company and I was doing a lot of interviews um, and particularly I was hiring from a global media director. Um, I came out, went to go and introduce myself to the candidate and she said to me, well I'm, I'm looking for Abby Adamson, can you tell Abby Adamson I'm here? I hadn't even, I was taking my hand up to shake her hand say, to introduce myself saying oh I am Abby so, and then she said, could you just get me um, a water, please? And could you just get me some biscuits, please? And I was like, okay. Um, I was like, oh, why well, you ain't gonna get the job? That's what I'm thinking in my head, right? I'm thinking you've already lost this. And she's like, when, when um, can you just let Abby know that I'm, I've been waiting for her? Like, this is absolutely ridiculous. And as I was like, okay, no worries. I'm gonna go and get you a water. I could hear the receptionist saying, do you know that was Abby Adamson that you, you just spoke to? She was like, what? Abby, Abby's, she's black. <laughs> um, oh, I was expecting, I was, oh, I've, I've seen the credentials. I was, I, I was expecting someone white. She was like, and then the re receptionist was like, well, you ain't getting the job. <laughs> and I came back um, and she had actually made her excuses and she left. Wow. So yeah, there you go. She thought I was the help. <laughs> yeah, not, not one of the most powerful people in the co company. She actually thought I was, I was the help. So there you go. I think I think for me one one example of, of microaggression. I, I imagine everyone here has had the same thing, um, where you know you speak to somebody on the phone, and then they come and see you in the office, and 
at so they either say something like oh you you're you're well spoken or uh, oh you're not what i expected and like so so for me like as i say working in the police so i'm an i'm an analyst and uh people are like oh you know analysts don't usually look like you and i'm like what what does that mean is that because i'm younger or is it just because i'm black and like people like sometimes they say it and you can sort of kind of see their eyes and they're like i shouldn't have said that and they like try and come up with some sort of excuse for it um and, you know riz talking about being mistaken for the vendance and stuff but i was once in a meeting where i basically did a presentation on this kind of um, high priority nominal that we had whose name was pretty similar to mine um and one of these the sergeants every time he referred to me in this meeting he called me by this kind of this high profile nominal's name um and it was an after about like, four times someone's just like oh, his that's not that's Curtis and so you're calling him by this like guy that he's doing a presentation on but he, that guy a uh, high priority nominal looked just like me he, he, I, you know it was a similar he was light-skinned he had shaved head back when I, I shaved head as well looked so similar to me and this sergeant was just like just casually referring to me to this guy's name and I was just like is no one going to pick up on this no one going to say anything or, or back me up and um, so that for me it's just kind of eye-opening it's the stuff where you're like am I allowed to get angry at this or do I have to just kind of ignore it be quiet and don't challenge and be aggressive so it's, it's you know, that's, i think that's the issue with microaggressions is it's it's not enough to really take an action against it's just like i've, I've got to just swallow this and, and go about my day and you know that happens time and time again until you know it just kind of reaches a, a boiling point so for me talking about um the whole microaggression thing right i've always struggled with my name Right, I'm Nigerian. I'm a very proud Nigerian. I used to call myself Topi. That's the second half of my name. Yes, you did. <laughs> and my mom used to get so angry because my best friend was Carly Ann Fox, who was the most beautiful girl in the world. She had a blonde bob, blue eyes. She was just perfect. And I wanted to be this girl. So I was calling my, at school, I'd be like, call me Faith. Call me Faith, because that was my English name, right? And my mom was like, your name is Tokwe. And I refused. So as I got older, if you guys notice, a lot of you guys call me Tammy. And it used to really upset me because people could not say my second name correctly. So I started calling myself Topi. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to use Tammy. And even people get Tammy wrong. They call me Amy. And I got to a point where I just said, don't worry, just call me T. Because I remember in school, I was, my surname's Nougat. I was called the N-word, right? Because they couldn't pronounce Nougat. I was called Tappy. I was called all sorts of names. So I find that our names is something that, you know, with the whole microaggression is something that people also use as a slight dig because they know they're pronouncing your name wrong and they don't even apologize. So if I see a name and I'm like, listen, I always use the excuse, English is not my first language. I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, but they don't even do that. Abby, from your industry, do you feel that that's another thing that people use is your name as a way to discriminate against you? 100%. Um, again, working in recruitment, um, I've worked with um, hiring managers where we are looking, and I have to say, in all honesty, Asian names, you know, where we're sitting down and I'm like, oh, very easy I, I pronounced it fine and they will say oh abs you know what I beg you don't put that person through because I can't be bothered to learn their name and I'm thinking that's illegal <laughs> you know that's 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 no you cannot do that it's massive you know your names are, are, are our names are part of our, our, our identity they're not all we are but they're a huge part of who we are and my thing is and I'm sure it's, I sound like a broken record we've all heard this how can you tell me you can say Tchaikovsky? How are you going to be out here saying the da Daenerys Targaryen? How are you going to be out here saying Vladlan Ibrahimovic, but you can't say someone else's name? You know, I don't understand. You know, it's so microaggressive and it, it goes down to, it comes down to erasure. You know, you are erasing an already marginalized group who are fighting to be heard just because you are in that powerful, you know, privileged place to be. But going back to um curtis curtis said um you know when they, sometimes the microaggressions you just you, you know you're just like in the end like oh god until you, until you blow but that's why i said accountability and the onus is on all of us to call out that bad behavior we're at a point where we're if someone's not saying your name right 
you correct them. It's not good enough for us to just say, you know, oh, it's all right, or call me T. Your name's not T. You know, that is not your name, you know? And I think it's really important that we don't allow people to strip us of our identity because we don't want to rock the boat or we don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. It's time people got uncomfortable. If we're trying to be on the right side of history and we're all trying to make um, society and our industries equitable, it's time people got uncomfortable. <laughs> that, that's absolutely great. Jana, from a yoga perspective, do you feel that you know um, race is something that plays in the whole yoga industry? Because for me, um, I remember there was a big incident in the fitness world and in the yoga world that happened towards the last year that I'm not going to talk about, but I think you might remember how we met the person that introduced us. Oh yes, I think I I I, I think kind I kind of do, but I, yeah. I won't. So there was but, an incident. But, that happened. Yeah, but definitely it's 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 yeah. there. I worked in a corporate background. I worked for like a top law um, law firm, so I know what Riz has <laughs> gone through um, in terms of that. But coming into the 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 yoga world, it's definitely there. I'm often the only person of color in a class. I'm the one holding space, and you know, um, so that that is an issue. And I've had people see me being the cover teacher or teacher and walk out of the room. <laughs> there's no kind of you know what you're doing whatever and I've people come into class see me and they try to make their their escape because they think that I don't have the prerequisite training and they're like oh I've got to leave at this time and it's okay fine and then the time comes and I deliberately say it's time for you to go now oh no I don't want to go because they can see I can teach so you know there's those kind of things you put up with and I've had people and, and an incident I, I I'll give you this and I won't named the studio, it was like many years ago and I've been doing body positive yoga and they wanted to bring body positive yoga to that studio or the, or the mainstream one. So we had the open day, the class was ran, the class was busy. And a few weeks later, I saw they put on social media about my class. So I was on, the, on, on their, their post, I was nameless. And number two, it said the first class of it type in, 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 in London. And I thought, what have I been doing for years? I've been teaching this style of yoga for a long time. So when I, um, so I spoke to a friend in the States, she's a quite well-known teacher. I said, shall I call it out? And they go, of course, don't I call it out? So I called it out um, discreetly. And they said, oh, I thought you taught out of London. I'm a Londoner through and through. So why am I going to out of London to go and teach a style when my audience is in London? So, if, and they said, well, I'll amend it for you. And what they did two weeks later, they erased the post. Instead of acknowledging me, they erased the post. That's how much they wanted to that they erased the post. So that's constantly what I go, I, I, I go through in, in that respect. But it, it's there all the time. You know, it's almost only room for one or you get the tokenism there as well. So it's only if um, they want you for a reason, you have something that they want, then you're there. But if not, there's only room for one in there and they're all fine. And, and you, they don't defend you, they'll defend the, 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 they'll defend the, the clients. I've had it before, I've been in a class and when COVID hit the, with Bikram yoga, we couldn't um, open our mouth to do the, the mouth breathing anymore, we to close it. So I went to the class, teaching the class, at the end I said, we're gonna just lie down the back and we're just gonna um, just finish in, in Sebastian with the mouth closed. And this woman got up and she challenged me in the class and sort of said, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we breathing the same way? She's proceeded to breathe. And I thought, I'm not taking this anymore. So I said, you know what, if you want to talk to me, let's go outside the room and talk. She didn't do that. So I went to the owner afterwards and, and, and said, there's an issue with this, um, this woman. And she turned to me and said, oh, at least she didn't complain about you. So it was okay that the woman could treat me that way. But if the woman had complained about me, she'd have you know, had a conversation with me. And that's the kind of things you put up. They don't listen to you. And you find as well, tell me that a lot of the time as a black yoga teacher, you get a lot of complaints because what they do, they ask for feedback after class and they can, behind on their computer, sending complaints. And it's only because of my reputation why it doesn't always get seriously, but they always pull me up about it. And then when they investigate further, oh, Donna, we're really sorry, we should have known better, but they're quick to run and, and you know, I'm the villain, uh, yes, you know, because of the color of my skin. Where I have um, colleagues, my white counterparts, talk to teachers and students in ways that I couldn't even think about, and they get away with it. And that's what happens very much in the yoga world. You know, they don't, they don't want, they, they don't cater for us, and we don't see the advertising, you don't see it at all, and they just, it's very elitist and that's why I do what I do. And that's why I say yoga's for everybody. And that's why you go on my page, you see very diverse images and I'm trying to change that, but it's still, it's still the same. 
even now, many months later, even last week, and I was going to complain about it, but again, the fear, Abby, that's why I haven't complained. They listed 10 yoga teachers and there wasn't one teacher of colour. They have a teacher of colour work in that magazine, but they couldn't list that person's class, online classes, as a potential for their readership. Wow. That's really that was good. last week. That was last week. Sorry, Ab, did you want to say something there? I, yeah, I was just like, <laughs> just, just, I'm just a bit fed up, you know, just how, just how difficult it is that, you know, people, well, we all find speaking up and defending ourselves because ultimately, you know, you know, we've, we've had jobs where you're thinking I need to pay my bills at the end of this month. So I need to just not say anything because, you know, I want to get paid and, you know, a lot of organizations have capitalized on that fear that they you know it's institutional you know it's institutional racism that's the way it's funneled into our, into law into the judicial system into the healthcare system into you know the fitness industry Abby you just hit the nail on the head can we talk about the whole covid situation and how it's how the fitness industry has in terms of ethnic minorities obviously the information that was first put out was like you know um, if it's COVID is um, affecting ethnic minorities a great deal and then from then it was no it wasn't it doesn't affect ethnic minorities at, at, at all and the information that's been put out there because for me I never saw anybody that looked like me right so when I was younger I didn't I only liked sports because I was a bit of a boy and anything a boy wanted to do I wanted to do it whereas my niece um, now sees a diverse group of people and now she wants to do sports because she sees girls that look like her do you feel that ethnic minorities might be more inclined to take part in physical activities and go to classes if they saw representation okay done i see your head shaking you can have this one yeah no, I, I, I totally um believe so and last year as i, and I refer back noir fit fest the first UK Black Fitness Festival, over 200 people attended it online. So it goes to show we had Black Fit Pros and we had the community and they came to it. So it shows that if they have that representation, more and more people would come. And I remember an incident where I was teaching um, for, I think it was on um, Yoga Magazine. And I, I used to just be invisible. I didn't want to be seen. I was doing the yoga, but I would hide, you know, and everybody you need, you need to represent. I thought, no, I'm all right, man, I'm all right. But I had to represent. And the one time where I really saw that I had to represent, I went to teach and it was outside. It was International Yoga Day, typical English weather. It was, it was rainy, it was overcast. I was being interviewed, the three o'clock came up. I want to chip, but I couldn't because I had to teach at five o'clock. Well, everyone's going to go home, man. No one's going to wait behind me. There's going to be no one turn up. And lo and behold, to me, I went to teach and the most black people turned up and they said, Donna, you need to be visible. We came here to, to support you. And from that moment, that key moment, I said I had to represent because it was like, even if one person who looks like me comes on the yoga mat, that's my job done. Same reason why I did Noir Fit Fest, uh, co um, created it, because I, was, I didn't think that we needed our own spaces. And I thought, no, and, and I was invited to be on a panel and it was called Black Women in, in, in Fitness. I was the only yogi on the panel. But to be in a room with other Black women and the issues that they said they had, and I wasn't even aware of it, it's like, oh my God, I need to represent because they do want to come into spaces. But because of the way they treated, they, they don't feel welcome, they're going to a yoga space, that people pick up their mat and move their mat or they get the looks, you know, and they're the only person maybe in the room. And, you know, from the, the moment they get into front of house to on that mat, it's not a nice journey and the experience they get. And that's why you definitely need the representation. And we well, need imagery to, to help with that as well. Imagery needs really helps, I think. Um, I, I completely agree with you. I'm gonna go back to, I'm gonna go back to the, what I said about allyship and how, we, how I feel, you know, when I was talking about, we can't do this on our own. I have loads of white friends that are in fitness that will not work with brands, you know, that will not, um, collaborate with them or endorse them or do any of their ads if they don't see people of colour in their imagery on their websites doing, you know, this is what I mean about, you know, really putting your money where your mouth is. No one, no black person, people of colour, we don't need people who pipe up when it's safe to do so. 
that's not what we need. We need people who are standing beside us and saying, yes, we will never understand because we don't live in the color of your, we don't live in your skin, but we are going to walk this walk with you. So it's again, when I see white people saying, I'm not going to work with X brand or, you know, whatever company, because they're not rep representing a true reflection of society. That's when I know that I've got time for them. You know, that's what I mean about being a true active ally. Nothing's going to change being passive. Nothing's going to change being performative. And I think that's incredibly important. Mm. And I forgot what the second point I was going to make is, but yeah. <laughs> I'm going to throw this out there, right? So um, last year I did a campaign um, for a brand and I feel really frustrated because I feel like there's a lot of mixed race individuals that saying they're black and they're the ones getting the roles or positions or the um, campaigns for black people or black women or black men. So that was one. So I was really happy because one of my goals was to work with a brand that would celebrate women in strong women, not women that look strong and you know they don't even lift. You know, you, you guys, let's be real. We see this all the time where all these brands use girls that lift a five kg dumbbell and say, yeah, I'm a strength athlete. And we know that's not true. So I was so excited to work with this brand and they were an amazing brand, but I was nervous because I worked with another brand who had a makeup artist that said to me, they don't do my skin tone, right? They don't have foundation for my skin tone. So when I uh, was doing the interview with this brand, they were like, I was like, do I have to bring my own makeup? I was really nervous because I didn't want to upset them. And they called their makeup artist and she was like, no, she doesn't need to bring her ma own makeup. When I got to the shoot, it was an ethnic minority who catered for everybody, who had the right foundation. And I felt so beautiful in myself because the last one I did, I looked orange, guys. I'm not, I looked, if I, you see, it's on my Instagram. Look at the makeup between the two campaigns I've done, which you guys have only done too. You can see the difference in my makeup, right? But what's also interesting about that other campaign that I did is that they were okay with me being my authentic self. They were okay with me wearing my braids or they were okay with me being thick. And I loved that about this brand. But going through Instagram and the whole Black Lives Matter, I'm seeing so many, I'm going to go back to it because I'm gonna throw it to Chris because this is a conversation Chris and I've had. You know, black, a mixed race individuals speaking about black experiences. And it's really important that we acknowledge that there is a difference between the experience of a dark skinned black person and a mixed race person. And there's also a difference between a light skinned black person because some light skinned black people can pass for being biracial or mixed race, depending on what people want to use. Chris, we've had this conversation. How do you feel about certain individuals talking about their experiences, a black woman and a black man in this fitness world and how woe is me? I think it's, it's a difficult one because like, I know that I've probably been afforded certain opportunities because I'm lighter skinned, but then I have like a bit more of a unique look, whether it's because of my hair or whatever it is, and I speak well. I know some people have not had the best experiences, like some of my family from, um, from back home in New Orleans where even if they're lighter skin or darker skin, they've had like similar experiences. My worst experiences were at school, but that's because I was the only black person there. Like there was one other black kid who I was friends with and his mum just went, I think he was, yeah, he was Nigerian. And his mum went, you're not staying here because she saw like how, how insidious or like the kind of like racism was. So they took it, so they took him out. I think I've noticed very much that I'm definitely afforded some different opportunities and different people speak to me or approach me. And I think it is because I'm lighter skinned. I noticed that when you look at any fitness brand, um, especially in CrossFit, you're going to see it. So there's not a whole lot of our faces in general in there, but if they are, they're probably more my skin tone or lighter, or they're going to look like more similar to me or Curtis in terms of their skin tone than they are to, are to you, Tammy. Like they're going to, and I think part of that is because there's not that many black people who actually do that style of fitness when it comes there to like, the CrossFit side of things. There is, there's but actually- not, but, but not that are being pub publicized, which I think is a thing. So then not more, more of us don't come in and do it because you don't think there is anyone that does it. Like I've known people who've come to 
lift with, let's say, me and Curtis at Rolling with different places because they're like, oh my God, there's actually other black people that do weightlifting. So then you end up almost congregating together because you're like, there's actually other people that are like me that I can relate to that I can actually go and do sport with. And I think when it comes to, like we were saying before, um, I'm not going to try and call out like any brands. I don't want to start any lots too too much because there's a lot of different. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. There's, there's a lot of different ones, but like we're saying about the websites when you're looking through and trying to scroll for clothes, like how many, how well represented are darker skin and lighter skin people? It's almost all light skin people if you are going to see them, like and I think that's I I, th I think that is I think that is the issue. It's not so much that there's not a lot of dark skin dark, darker skin people coming forward to do things. So I know that it's not just going to be. Obviously, it's not just going to be we talk about it today and then when Baron starts to say we're going to address it tomorrow, it's fixed. But it's kind of like you'd expect something by now after like all the George Floyd stuff and all the kind of like, the action and the positive conversations. But you still kind of see it where it's like, yeah, there are some non-white people <laughs> being represented and some people who are obviously black or of a mixed heritage. But that for me, like when I look at it, I'm like that, rep that representation is missing. And I Do feel like it's being... That there's a distinction between black men and black women yes because yes i i don't know how you guys feel but i definitely see there's more in terms of like going from like lighter skin like more mixed heritage people like myself all the way to like actually like fully dark darker skinned people you get more of a wet you get more of an even representation in 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 male fitness i think i don't know if that's just because i know more darker skinned males who do fitness and who do sport than i do than i do women but that's what i personally see whereas when you go over to the female side it is usually lighter skinned people and then can we also include this with the whole hair texture? Because, and I'm gonna throw this out to my, to the women on the panel. Do you feel that when you're in the fitness industry, you have to look a certain way and also changing your hair? Because I've noticed the women that are pushed or the black women that are pushed in the fitness industry generally have weaves and wear very little clothing. And I, I'm from that background that I'm a Christian, right? So, and I choose not to show to march in because that's just my beliefs, right? But speaking to the younger generation that's coming up and speaking to one of my best friends who is quite big in the industry, he said, Tammy, you know your stuff, you've got the experience, just wear a sports bra and an itty bitty short and you will, you will start selling, but make sure you wear a weave and not your braids. Can I throw this out to you? Well, it goes, yeah, it goes back to what I was saying about cultural assimilation. You know, it's to assimilate. My, my, um, I don't know if you remember my mum um, told me, but my mum is very, very fair skinned. I'm actually the darkest. I'm the oldest of four girls and I'm actually the darkest in skin colour. Um, and we all have the same mum, same dad. I just happen to be darker than everybody else. Now, my sisters are fair. Ooh. Uh, are you gone again? Um, yeah. Dana, do you want to jump in till she comes back? Uh, oh, what was the question again? I've listened to her so much that you're here. No, it was just talking about the fact that, you know, we have to look a certain way if we want to be seen as commercial. So for example, a little wearing a low sports bra or wearing tight shorts or pretty much looking, I love this girl and I'm going to throw her name out there. I love everything about her. I think she's amazing. But I think Britney Babe is the way that we're sold as black women that we have to look in the traditional fitness world to be seen as commercial to the point where she her technique is not the best but she's beautiful and she wears very little clothes and a hell of a lot of makeup but brands like Gymshock that I love and respect push her and push a lot of females that have no clothes on and all look the same even if they're different skin tones if that makes sense. I think it's that, that there's an image that, you know, certain black female bodies, you know, they over-sexualize it and it's playing into to that, I believe. It's not so much in yoga, I don't think, but definitely you see in, you know, from the hip hop videos, the, you know, the scantily clad women, and then that imagery, whatever is coming through into fitness, I think. And that's why I believe that is. And maybe they think that's what sells and they're playing to a stereotype to cater to a certain audience, mainly men. That you know, women have got to be scantily clad <laughs> to sell whatever it is they're selling. Maybe not female clothing, but whatever else they're selling to sell. You know, Abby, you back? Does anybody want to join jump in on this question, Alex? Um, Alex, Ben, from a male perspective, from a white 
heterosexual male point of view? Don't worry, I, you can jump back in. The boys are too scared to talk. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Zoom won't let me be great tonight. It won't let me be great. It's just trying to ruin my flow. I swear to you, because it knows I'm about to drop. Shine. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm trying to say, was a liar. Oh, I say, what was you saying? We're talking about cultural assimilation. Yeah. Yeah, it's got, going back to, if you're fairer skinned, let me, I'm going to just be blunt. Black women are bottom of the barrel. They're bottom of the barrel citizens. Sorry. Um, bottom of the barrel citizens. You know, black men, there's, a, there's, a, there's an essence of fetishization with black men. There is, but you know, we don't have enough time for us to start going into all of that, you know? But it goes back to the fairer you are as a woman, the more attractive you are. There's a reason why the, you know, the, um, straight European hair, the standards of beauty has been, has been capitalized on. You know, there's a reason why bleaching creams, for instance, are incredibly, um, you know, it's a, it's a lucrative industry. And it goes back to this, I think I mentioned about video girls. I think I'm, I'm sure I mentioned something about video girls. It goes back to this is what is beautiful. You know, Zoom is playing with Abby today. Are not beautiful. This is this is the narrative. Oh my God, don't tell me it's gone again. No, keep talking. Yeah. We got you, we, get, we got you, you're back, you're okay. back. Okay, cool. Um, it's this, you know, black women, dark, so when I say black women, I mean dark skinned women. And do you know what? When um, Chris acknowledged um, the, the fact that he's fair skinned and you know there's some maybe some privileges he's been afforded that's all i want to hear as a dark skinned woman because what hey the devil the devil wants to catch him guys i can't help it the nigerian side is coming out and abs that's not let me take this <laughs> off because that's not and i love my abs too much to leave that one <laughs> on yeah can I come in, Tammy, while whilst, whilst she's missing? Of course you can. And it's, it, you know, it's, it ties in with the notion of, you know, uh, uh, people conforming to, you know, uh, Western ideals of beauty and, you know, uh, not, not allowing people to sort of, uh, sort of thrive as they are, you know, with, with, with you know, their the, the natural beauty and, you know, uh, the, um, the, the ability to sort of like be, be engaging in sports fitness without having to sort of like you know meet live up to particular ideals or standards and I think it comes it comes back down to the issue of inclusivity I think you know uh, a, a lot of sports a lot of uh, you know a lot of organizations in the fitness world uh, you know especially since last year uh, where you know everyone engaged in this sort of performative sort of allyship I think now we need to we need to be talk, taking those organisations to task, and, and and to you know force them and compel them to commit uh, to to the um, to the to, to the uh, commitments that they sort of uh, professed uh, last year. And I, I think one 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 of those issues is um, removing obstacles and barriers and hurdles uh, to um, participation in sports. So you know coming back to what I mentioned earlier on. The issue that we had last year with uh, British powerlifting and the IPF uh, preventing uh, essentially uh, people from the Muslim faith from participating in competition because of this barrier uh, uh, in, in terms of not allowing uh, we, uh, lifters to wear uh, full body costumes on, uh, underneath their singlets uh, without any sort of objective reasoning for it. You know, that, that sort of thing, I think we need to continue to challenge and to press. And indeed, we did that last year before COVID, before George Floyd. Uh, you know the uh, the lifter from the Midlands, Fazana Ahmed. You know, quite bravely took uh, you know put forward a motion saying that you know we need to remove this obstacle. It prevents me from competing, and there's no objective reasoning uh, for maintaining that. And we went along to the AGM, and you know, you know we we're talking about allyship. All of the people uh, who were at the AGM uh, and those who voted by proxy all voted in favour of that motion to to remove the bar. On uh, lifters being able, uh, be, not being able to compete if they wear um, uh, full body clothing and wearing uh, knee sleeves, uh, and, and you know, thankfully everyone sort of came forward and sort of like you know proved their allyship and sort of stood stood in solidarity. I think there was a, a couple of people who abstained from the vote, and one person who took it upon themselves to uh, 
vote against that motion. Uh, so that motion was passed, and uh, immediately, a, a week or so afterwards, uh, British Powerless and the board, uh, in particular, uh, sort of undid the work that, uh, uh, and the progress that had been achieved in that meeting. So, so the, uh, the motion was put in neutral terms, i.e. any lifter can wear um, full body clothing uh, underneath their singlet and uh, compete wearing knee sleeves. And that, that had particular relevance to me as a Muslim male because the concept of hijab uh, doesn't uh, solely apply to Muslim women, it applies to Muslim men as well. So I wasn't comfortable previously competing uh, with only a singlet with, with, with my legs uncovered because I see it as a religious requirement on, on males. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to do so, to, to cover their legs uh, as well. Um, so the motion was put forward in neutral terms and quite strangely, quite bizarrely actually, uh, the, the British Powerlifting Board came back a week after or so and said, oh, this, this motion that was passed actually only applies to Muslim female lifters. And that was totally against what had actually been passed and what was actually discussed at the AGM. And uh, I sort of, you know, opened correspondence again with Richard Parker uh, 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 of uh, British Powerlifting. Uh, and, you know, there's some e email exchanges going back and forth. Uh, I was trying to sort of clarify what the position was. And ultimately, we were just simply told um, they'll, they'll respond in, in due course if they, think, if they think it's appropriate to add any further clarification. Um, so the problem is, um, you know, barring entry on a, on a on a grassroots level, that 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 means that we're we're just not afforded any role within that sport. And then also going forward, what we need to see, and, and this applies in the judiciary, applies in the legal profession, the police, and, and no doubt other uh, professions. Um, we need to see more people from you know black and minority ethnic backgrounds uh, rising up the ranks because only once we've got people from our communities up in those sort of positions are we then able to have a voice within the organization uh, you know at the moment we're sort of you know at, at, at the periphery and sort of like, you know kept kept at arm's length and you know we're celebrated when it, when, when, when they when they want to celebrate us and we're dropped uh, when they don't want to so you know I, I think moving forward I think that's what we need to be aiming for uh, more more people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds to be sort of you know, part of the, uh, part of the organizations that are, that are running uh, you know federations or institutes or uh, you know that sort of thing uh, and I think, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier on, I think we need, we need to continue on an individual level and as, on a societal level to continue to sort of like, you know, take these people to task, take these organizations to task, compel them to, you know, stand by their commitments and let, let, let's, not, let's, not, uh, let's not accept tokenism, let's not accept, uh, you know, performative actions or words without, uh, with, without any action, you know, to back it up. Riz, can you talk about um, um, the incident that happened? Sorry, what was that? Remember the, the mental, mental incident? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's bizarre as well because it was only around the time. So, so what happened was the guy from Metal, the, 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 which is a company which produces powerlifting gear, uh, this, the CEO of that company, around the time of the George Floyd uh, murder, uh, came out and uh, posted a posted a meme or something, which was you know uh, quite clearly racist. Thinking back, I think it was uh, an image of George Floyd. Yeah, basically, um, the actual image of the incident, um, and then that's right. Yeah, it's in pink, and, then, uh, and then highlighted yeah. in pink. And it even yeah, so. to say it makes me feel so uncomfortable that if yeah. I feel so uncomfortable just saying it. That I can't believe no. somebody thought it was acceptable to post that no. onto social media. No. Well, we, we, we say that you know we, we found it you know unbelievable that a person would, would post it, but then you know, at that time when I, when I looked into who this person was, it became abundantly clear why this person uh, had posted that, and that is because the IPF had approved this company's gear on its approved list. And it turns out that this person, for years and years, had been a, a, a member of the Finnish far right uh, 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 party, and so for years and years he'd said stuff, you know, xenophobic stuff, you know, uh, posted material about migrants and Muslims and other uh, ethnic minorities, uh, you know, and it begs belief that the IPF, you know, an international organisation which has you know, aspirations to uh, become recognised as an Olympic sport, was, you know had this company as, as an approved company on, on their list. 
uh, and so, so that happened. And th this is around the time where I think the CEO of CrossFit, I think, I think had, had posted a yeah. similar thing. Yeah. Over there, in that arena, and quite, quite rightly, you know, Reebok and other companies came out and said, you, you know what, we're, 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 we're taking away our sponsorships. We're distancing ourselves from, you know, what's happened and what you've said. Uh, and, you know, cancelled contracts, uh, which is the right thing to do. Uh, the IPF, however, uh, came back with some wishy-washy statement about, you know, the IPF doesn't tolerate racism in any form, et cetera, et cetera, but said nothing about what, what, what they're actually going to do in respect to this, this person. And, and so there's a lot of controversy which came about as a result of that. Uh, and surprisingly, what was surprising was that some lifters, both here in the UK and, and, and worldwide, uh, you know, sort of kept coming back and saying, oh, you know, there's, there's too many people sort of, uh, you know, following this sort of like woke trend or, you know, cancel culture. And, you know, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing that. Look at the impact that this is going to have on individuals. Individuals who previously now bought um, metal gear will no longer be able to compete with it. And, uh, you know, that was sort of muddy in the waters a bit because that, the, the reality was that uh, in terms of metal gear that was approved for use in IPF competitions, I think there's four items. Uh, wrist straps, socks, a singlet, and a belt. Uh, so all the you know expensive equipped powerlifting gear that wasn't approved in, in any event. So you know all of that stuff uh, you know can be discounted readily. Things like wrist straps and socks aren't expensive. If you're a lifter and you know you, you now need to, you, you now need to buy new socks. So I think um, I think SBD were even offering to swap out singlet. No, not even just that though. SBD yeah, you're right. They were offering to swap it out. I, I, SBD were amazing. They said they will swap it yeah. out and change it for them. But also Greater London said um, that they will take the hit and they will find hit um, for these individuals that are out of pocket. So both SBD and um, Greater London and a lot of the other um, surrounding counties did step up to stick up. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like a lot of people kept quiet and that really offended me. Um, going back to what you were talking about with the CrossFit, I remember when that incident happened um, because that was when I did one of the photo shoots and I was really excited and I posted that photo shoot online, right? Mm. And somebody sent a picture of me um, and put a monkey face on, right? And I was so upset and I was crying. And this is what I said, guys, representation matters, but it's also important that people stick up so I went to view a facility to hold um, like a training camp, right? And um, this was because of Alex, actually. Alex told me, oh, CrossFit London are doing this. So I went in and I was wiping my tears because I don't want to be seen as weak. I don't want to be seen as vulnerable. So the guy was um, explaining to me that he's actually put in his money where his mouth is and encouraging ethnic minority trainers to use the facility at a discounted price to make sure that they have a space that they can afford to build up their business. And he was asking me what was up. And I said to him what had actually happened and he couldn't believe it. But a lot of women that I know get things like that where they get comments about their body or you know things like that. So people like that metal guy groans in all different aspects of our lives and we run into individuals like that far too often that you know then we actually want to admit but abby do you want to finish off with you know before your in uh, your wi-fi decides to play up again and try it to have no respect for me <laughs> round up this conversation i i i mean i would love for these conversations the facts of the facts of oh, no, 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 start again the fact of the matter is Rome wasn't built in a day. The reason why we look at, we go on holiday, we see these Roman architectures and Roman stuff that has been standing through the test of time is because they took the time to do it. And that's exactly what we need to do when we're talking about anti-racism, when we're talking about equitable policies and practices, and we're talking about, you know, um, leveling the playing field or upheaving things as, as they are so that we, we have the status quo. We need to keep talking. You know, the only way we're going to make these changes, positive changes, is if we hold pe ourselves and if we hold other people accountable. And the reason why I say ourselves is because it's not just down to white people to make this happen. You know, again, we are not looking for white saviors. You know, no one's looking for a white savior. I think that's very, very important. 
you know, and I think a lot of white people mistake white saviorism with allyship. That's not what we want. You know, we want people to stand beside us. But that said, I can't keep having the same conversation with black people who are telling me, oh, I can't, I can't say anything, you know, oh, I'm too scared. No, 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 no. We've got to break those fear barriers. Everybody has to meet each other halfway. I'm not saying as someone who's gone through institutional racism, as someone who's been on the, as who's had horrible things said to them, um, well, said to me as a, you know, as a woman, number one, as someone who's black, number two, and from a, from a, from a socioeconomic background as well. I know that the onus is on me to be the change that I want to see, not to sound all sanctimonious, but it is about all of us putting our mouth, you know, stop, sorry, putting our words into action. We've been talking, this is, this is amazing. We talk, we talk, that's great. We need to start doing. And I think that's, you know, that for me is important. And for that to happen, we need to keep these conversations. We need to put, push these narratives forward. That's the only way changes are going to happen. So Abby, if people want to kind of learn more, because I do find a lot of people ask me, oh, you know, about how do I learn more? And I'm like, I'm not here to teach you. There's so much mm -hmm. information and you are an educator. I'm not necessary. I'm not great with my words. I stumble and I mumble my so words. Do I. I don't know why people say <laughs> that. <laughs> As an educator, where can people find you? Edinson.com. Long. <laughs> there you go. Plug, say, my, plug my Say services. that again. Say that again. Abbyadamson.com. Um, that's that's you know that's my website. Um, I think it's very. We have Google. I'm not trying to be cheeky, but also you can hit Google. There's stuff that if you want to find out that, you know, you can't expect black people to be on the receiving end of shit. Excuse my language. Sorry, and people of color to be on the receiving end of, of rubbish, and for us to save the day at the same time. That's a lot, you know, to save the day and to be educating. Um, and I think you can go on online like the rest of us have done and, and, and figure it out. You know, I always say it's an incredibly, it's a, it's a privilege in itself to be learning about racism than be on the receiving end of it. Mm. And but if you do want me to help, please reach out to me. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> Curtis, and if people wanted to find out more about your lifting career and you as a lifter, um, where can they find you? You're on mute. <laughs> they can't hear you, Curtis. <laughs> right, there we go. So yeah, um, I'm on Instagram. Um, my handle, I think, I got to double check this really quickly now. Uh, <laughs> it will be on the screen as well, don't yeah. worry. There we go, Curtis L. Williston on Instagram. I'm perfect. So Donna and yourself, if somebody wanted to find you, um, you know, hire you for, a, let's say, a yoga retreat or to teach them about yoga or just wanted to understand more about, you know, the whole you know, positive body yoga, where can they find you? They can find me either um, on Instagram at Donna Noble, Donna Noble Yoga or Curse on Yoga on Instagram or the Noble Art of Yoga .co.uk, the website. And last but not least, the main man himself, where can they find you? Because you've got some really great lifts up on your Instagram. So tell people where your ID is so they can follow you. For your wise words. It's, it's, it's mediocrity at its highest. That's, that's, that's all I can say. Never, uh, never. Uh, Riz, Riz underscore PB uh, on Instagram. Uh, you know, I train at Build Differently Gym, so you can find me there or see me at regional comps, uh, great, great London divisional comps, uh, which is... Uh, the furthest I've managed to get so far. <laughs> I competing against Ben actually, who, who seems to be totally in the same total every time I every time I compete, but uh, always at a, a lesser body weight. So he has that on me. Uh, <laughs> so thank you guys for coming today. I just want to say, um, give the last word to Ben because Ben's got an amazing announcement that's going to be going live soon, but we want to share it with you guys because by the time you guys are watching this. Ben will have announced this to the world. Go on, Ben. Talk about this one. Tell them what your new position is. Oh, that one. That I think about our one. That one, not that one. That's not as important as your one. So, um, it will be officially announced in the next couple of weeks, I think, if our friend Richard Parker um, can, can sort himself out. So I'm the new scholarship and sponsorship officer for uh, British powerlifting, so at least a stage of injecting a bit of youth into the uh, the organisation, to say the least. And you know, it's a first step to uh, 
bigger and better things in the next, you know, hopefully five, 10, 15 years. But, you yeah, know, it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be an exciting step, uh, at least to get involved in that, that aspect of it. Clap, guys. Clap for him. Clap for him. Come on. Come on. Be nice. Be nice. You know, well you've, done, earned, you've, earned, you've earned this position. So congratulations, Greg. So on that note, um, thank you guys so much for um, this chat. And it's really important that we keep this communication open and this dialogue open and, you Absolutely. know, let's keep it going. It won't happen overnight. Things no. won't change overnight, but- This is an amazing network. That's it. You tell them, Abby, you get, Abby, you get have the last word, go on. And she's gone again. You see, you see, you see. So, uh, thank you um, guys. You know, this is a match. Just come back, I'm frozen up. You're back. You're I'm back. frozen You're up. Back. I don't know what I'm saying. No, <laughs> I'm just no, saying, have keep this going. Go on. Let's keep this going. Connect with each other on socials, you know. I'm happy to send some literature, happy to send some golden nuggets if you want to know how you have difficult conversations when it comes to, you know, calling the elephant in the room out. Um, when it comes to race and racial equality, I'm happy to help. I personally think we should all be talking about this. We're all trying to do better. We're all trying to be better. Once you know better, you do better. And that's what we're here for. That's it, guys. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And we will see you on the next episode. Bye, guys. See you later.